Eh, pronto, buongiorno. Senta, ehm, qualcuno è praticamente entrato in casa sfondando la finestra e ha messo un molto di sordine e c'è una porta chiusa. On November the 2nd, 2007, police in Perugia receive a phone call. There's been a break-in. When police arrive, they discover a young woman has been stabbed to death. She's Meredith Kircher, a British student, a girl with everything to live for. Amanda, Amanda. Amanda. For seven years, her American flatmate, Amanda Knox, was the center of a media and judicial storm accused of Meredith's murder. In 2015, the murder convictions of Amanda Knox and Raffaele Sollecito were overturned once and for all. It's... She deserved so much in this life. Uh, I... I'm the lucky one. The family of Meredith Kircher feels let down by the Italian judiciary for the contradictory verdicts it has produced over nearly eight years. <music> Meredith Kircher grew up in Croydon, South London. In August 2007, a new university year is about to start. Meredith, now 21, prepares to leave for the ancient and peaceful hilltop city of Perugia, Italy. She was very excited about coming to Italy, looking forward to learning more about Italian culture, um, seeing the city of Perugia and making new friends. Um, and she really fought to come here. She, she really wanted to be here. Mez, as everyone calls her, is studying European politics and Italian at Leeds. Now she has an exchange year in Italy, a country she's been in love with since a school trip. But saying goodbye to her sister Stephanie isn't easy. We were just talking on the sofa and having a little cuddle goodbye and then I just remember her suddenly crying and saying that she was going to be sad to go but she was excited to come and I remember being quite taken aback so I thought, don't make me sad, I'll miss you but you'll go and have fun. She leaves on September the 1st and quickly afterwards moves into the upstairs flat of this cottage with three housemates, two young Italian trainee lawyers and a student on exchange from the United States, 20-year-old Amanda Knox. Amanda has traveled almost 6,000 miles from Seattle on the northwest coast to study Italian in Perugia. Photogenic, outgoing and describing herself as quirky, Amanda Knox loves the Beatles and Harry Potter. She's been studying at university and has worked three jobs to pay for her Italian adventure. She is very different from the quiet and studious Meredith. While housemates, there is said to be tension over Amanda's supposedly casual attitude to sex, money and housework. Within weeks, Amanda Knox lands a job in Perugia, working as a waitress at Le Chic, a pub owned by a popular musician from the Congo, Patrick Lumumba. She gave me the impression of a good person. If she wasn't a good person, she wouldn't have worked here. That doesn't mean that her relationship with clients pleased me, because she often talked to the clients, and I had to tell her to get back to work. On October the 25th, Amanda and Meredith go to a classical music concert together, where Amanda meets Italian student Raffaele Sollecito. He looks like her favorite, Harry Potter, and the two begin a whirlwind romance. Described by friends as intelligent and sensitive, the handsome Raffaele has come to Perugia to study information technology. 
A week later, October the 31st, it is Halloween, and in Perugia, like every other university town, it's party time. It is one of Meredith's favorite nights out, and she is dressed as a vampire. These will turn out to be among the last photographs of her alive. Happy, full of life, and completely at home with her new friends. What happens on the night of November the 1st, 2007, has been the subject of three trials, three appeals, and three Supreme Court rulings. The story has more twists and turns than the medieval streets of Perugia itself. The story starts at 9 o'clock in the morning on the 2nd of November, when a local woman finds two mobile phones in her garden. She takes them to the postal police, which handles crimes involving communication devices. They quickly discover one of the phones is registered to Via della Pergola 7, a small cottage just 500 meters away. When police arrive here, they see two students in the driveway, Amanda Knox and Raffaele Sollecito. They tell the police the front door is open and one room has been ransacked. Police go into the house. One bedroom's a mess. Clothes are all over the floor and a large rock is lying near the window. Shortly after the postal police arrive, around 12.51, Raffaele Sollecito calls the elite police force, the Carabinieri. He doesn't mention that the postal police are already there and says nothing's been stolen. Details prosecutors would later claim are significant. Eh, pronto, buongiorno. Senta, ehm, qualcuno è praticamente entrato in casa sfondando la finestra e ha messo molto disordine, c'è una porta chiusa. Avvia e... Io della Pergola. Perugia Gravinieri. Della Pergola 7. Via? Della Pergola 7 a Perugia. Furto in abitazione, eh? No, non c'è, non c'è furto. Meanwhile, Amanda says she's worried about her friend, Meredith. Her door's locked. She's not answering the phone. When the door is broken down, they discover a beige duvet on the floor. Beneath it, the battered and bloody body of Meredith Kircher. Prosecutor Giuliano Mignini arrives just after 2 p.m. He finds Meredith is partially naked, her bras being cut off and her T-shirt rolled up above her breasts. It looks like a sexual assault. When you start an investigation, you don't know what happened. You have to slowly reconstruct the situation. Forensics teams work inside and outside the cottage. Right away, they think it's a staged break-in. Glass shards are on top rather than underneath the scattered clothes. The large rock seems too heavy to be thrown from the ground to the first floor window and too big to go through the small crack between the shutters. A handbag, jewelry case, camera and laptop computer are lying in full view. There's a line of bloody shoe prints from Meredith's room to the front door. And in the bathroom, a bloody bare footprint is on the bath mat. Over four days, investigators collect more than 400 items from the apartment, photographing and filming their work. Meredith's bra has been sliced off, but when police bag it for evidence, they notice something is missing. Somehow, the investigators leave without it, a critical error that will haunt the prosecution case. 
The autopsy shows Meredith has been strangled and stabbed on two sides of the neck, possibly with two different knives. The second fatal stab severed her thyroid artery. There are 40 wounds, too many, police believe, for one assailant to have inflicted alone. The prosecution's view of what happened, later disputed by the defense, is shown in this reconstruction. Meredith was trained in karate and must have encountered overwhelming force. Una stessa persona non poteva contemporaneamente tenere One person couldn't, all at the same time, hold Meredith still and hold back her hands because there are very few defensive wounds, inflict those wounds with a smaller knife and then give her the fatal blow with the larger knife. It is impossible. Not even Superman could do it. The behavior of Amanda Knox and her boyfriend attracts attention. Meredith's friends tell police that far from appearing distraught, Amanda and Raffaele have been seen laughing and joking. A vigil is held for Meredith, but Amanda and Raffaele don't attend. They go for dinner at a friend's instead. And the prosecutor recalls why he was concerned by Amanda's behavior. When the girls were brought to see the knives that were in the kitchen, the reaction of Amanda, it was a reaction, she put her hands on her ears, as if she were trying to block out a terrible sound she was hearing in her ears. It was like she was having a nervous breakdown. And then there was this, one of the defining images of the case. Amanda and Raffaele kissing outside the cottage where Meredith was murdered. Her supporters say this was only natural. Did they comfort each other? We've seen that famous footage of the two of them together. They did. What's wrong with any of that? Nothing. It did appear to be wrong to some authorities. November the 5th, four days after the murder, Raffaele Sollecito is called in for questioning. Amanda goes with him, and once again her behavior seems odd. She does yoga and the splits in the waiting room. At this point, the couple's alibi appears to fall apart. Amanda had told police she'd spent the night of the murder at Raffaele's apartment. They cooked, watched a film, made love, smoked marijuana and went to bed. But separately, Raffaele's story begins to change. He's no longer sure if Amanda was with him all night. Amanda's called in for more questioning. As she is only a witness at this stage, an interpreter is present, but she has no legal representation. What happens next is crucial and one of the most controversial twists in the story. Police ask Amanda Knox about text messages on her phone. In particular, a message from her boss, Patrick Lumumba. Don't come to work tonight because there aren't enough clients. It's like Sunday. I sent that message not to come. Amanda had texted back, see you later. She says she just meant see you around. But police now want to know. Had Amanda arranged to meet Lumumba later that evening and taken him to her house? At 1.45 in the morning, Amanda breaks down. She says she had entered the house with him because he was attracted to Meredith and wanted to be with Meredith. And she stayed in the kitchen and heard Meredith screams, and he was the assassin. That's what she said. Police believe Amanda Knox's story. They raid Patrick Lumumba's home and take him in. Within hours, his photo flashes around the world as one of the murder suspects. But for the police, Amanda Knox has now gone from witness to suspect. If she's taken Lumumba to Meredith, she must have been at the house. 
Lei si è posta nel luogo del delitto. She put herself at the scene of the crime. She admitted to accompanying Lumumba as if she were an accomplice in his project. She was in the room next door when the crime happened, in her version. This fact pushed the police to suspend the audition in order to protect her rights. November the 6th, 2007. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Sollecito are arrested. Waiting to be taken to jail, Amanda makes another attempt to tell police what happened with Lumumba by writing out an explanation in English. She tells the police it's a present. In my mind, I saw Patrick in flashes of blurred images. I saw him near the basketball court. I saw him at my front door. I saw myself cowering in the kitchen with my hands over my ears, because in my head I could hear Meredith screaming. But I have said this many times so as to make myself clear. These things seem unreal to me, like a dream. I want to make it clear that I'm very doubtful of the verity of my statements, because they were made under the pressure of stress, shock, and extreme exhaustion. But despite her uncertainty, she doesn't retract her accusation. Lumumba remains in jail, pleading his innocence. In the city square, members of the African community protest his arrest. The black man is always the thief and the assassin. She wanted them to believe what she was saying. It was just because I was black. She was looking for someone in society who was credible. There was a moment when she should have actually retracted that story. There was a moment when she should have said, no, this is the wrong thing to do. I, I'm, he was thrown into jail for two weeks, or just over two weeks, for something he did not do, and he lost his livelihood. At this point, another African immigrant enters the story. 20-year-old Rudy Guede from the Ivory Coast is living in Perugia. Detectives find his bloody thumbprint on a pillowcase that was underneath Meredith's dead body. Because he's an immigrant, they have his prints on file. Police raid his tiny bedsit apartment and test his toothbrush for DNA. It matches traces found on Meredith's bra strap, on her body, and on the left sleeve of her pale blue sweatshirt. Rudy Guede has fled the country. He's arrested in Germany. Perugia attorney, Walter Biscotti, volunteers to defend him. I met this young man in this prison in Schiffenstadt, Germany. And he seemed to me like a guy who was scared, someone who was in the middle of a story that was bigger than him. He was surprised to see a lawyer who arrived from Italy for him. Extradited back to Italy, Rudy Guede confirms to police that he's lived in the country since the age of five. A keen basketball player, He'd met Amanda and Meredith after shooting hoops with students who lived in the apartment below theirs. They partied and smoked dope together. Meanwhile, the case against Patrick Lumumba, as outlined by Amanda Knox, collapses. A customer at the bar has given him an alibi and he's freed. How did Amanda Knox come to mention Lumumba's name to police? For the first time, we can hear an audio tape of her explanation to the prosecutor. A transcript of this was presented in court, but not the audio. Accompanied by three lawyers and an interpreter, on December the 17th, 2007, Knox is asked why she told police Lumumba committed the crime. Why? 
why I was stressed, I was scared. It was after long hours in the middle of the night. I was innocent and they were telling me that I was guilty. Che cosa su che cosa le diceva la polizia? What did police tell you? The police were telling me that we know you were at our house, we know that you left the house, and what the moment before I said Patrick's name, they were put, someone was showing me his, um, the message that I was sent on the phone. Che cosa c'è di più normale che insistere? La polizia fa la tua parte. I could, I could understand why they were telling me that I was lying. They kept telling non capiva me perché... Ma che pot- perché poi prima ci ha detto potrebbe essere vero. So what's the extent of the police evidence at this point? It includes the knife found at Raffaele Sollecito's apartment that they believe could be the murder weapon. But they need more, so return to the crime scene. 46 days after the murder, they find Meredith's bra clasp under a mat. Using rubber gloves, they pick it up and inspect it. It will become the most controversial piece of evidence in the investigation. The defense will claim the delay in collecting it could have resulted in contamination. Investigators also, for the first time, use luminol to look for invisible bloodstains. Three clear footprints appear, plus other small bloodstains. More new evidence, but it will be controversial. In Seattle, the campaign to prove Amanda is innocent is underway. Her family turned to a crisis communications firm and a group called Friends of Amanda. It was just this kind of small group of people that were called the Americans in our offense. I think there was one quote that the Americans would send in the Marines to get Amanda Knox. I love Italy, I've been to Italy, and I have great respect for the courts. I do think we have a rogue prosecutor. In Italy, if you speak against the prosecution, you can be prosecuted. So nobody can speak. And it, it's a perfect storm of a potentially very unfair prosecution. Amanda Knox's DNA has been found mixed together with Meredith Kircher's in five blood stains in the flat. Plus, tests show the bare footprints made in blood match the size and shape of Amanda's and her boyfriend's feet. And the kitchen knife from Raffaele's apartment shows Amanda's DNA on the handle and a tiny trace of Meredith's DNA on the blade. The clock spins forward almost one year to September 2008. Amanda Knox, Raffaele Solecito and Rudy Guede appear before a judge in Perugia. With so much publicity now surrounding Knox, Guede opts to be tried quickly and separately. I was convinced that if he had been tried with the others, that with all the international media clamor and the international pressure there would have been surrounding this trial, they would have dumped all the blame on Rudy. So you have to see the role that money plays, even be the USA or even here, in your situation as a citizen or as a, as a, um, as a person, uh, as a suspect, right? Um, you're not, the justice system is not fair, no matter where you are, because money is going to play a role. The prosecution's case is a tabloid editor's dream. They say Amanda Knox, Raffaele Solecito and Rudy Guede killed Meredith Kircher in a sex game gone wrong. Guede denies this and pleads not guilty. His defense is that he wasn't in the room when Meredith was murdered. He was in the bathroom. 
Meredith had invited him over, he said. When he got there, Meredith was furious because money was missing and she was blaming Amanda. He says he comforted Meredith and things got physical, but they didn't have full sex. He went to the toilet, then says he heard Amanda enter the apartment. He heard Amanda's voice as she came in. He was in the bathroom or just about to go into the bathroom and then he really did put on his headphone and listen to music, rap I think, at full volume and then heard a scream. He came out and came up against a male figure. Rudy Guede says this man lunged at him with a knife, cutting his hand. The attacker then yelled, black man found, black man condemned, and ran away. Guede found Meredith bleeding in the other room. He tried to stem the blood flow with towels and left a bloody thumbprint on the pillowcase. But the bleeding didn't stop, and Guede says he panicked. He tried to help her. He took her in his arms and should have called for help, but he was scared and ran away, and he feels guilty for this. Rudy Guede is found guilty of Meredith's murder and sentenced to 30 years. The judge's verdict says Rudy Guede did not act alone. He's led away to prison. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito will now stand trial for the murder and sexual assault of Meredith Kircher. January the 16th, 2009. The trial begins. The world's media is focused on Amanda Knox. Her face fills the front pages. Could this attractive, bubbly, all-American girl be capable of murder? As they did at Rudy Guede's trial, the prosecution again suggests the murder was the result of a sex game gone wrong. Again, this is strongly denied. Amanda and Raffaele claim they weren't in the house that night. To support their case, the prosecution produces evidence they claim places the couple at the scene of the murder. First, there's the DNA found in the bathroom. The prosecution says it shows the mixed blood of Amanda Knox and Meredith Kircher in the bidet drain, the sink drain, and on a cotton bud box. There is also a large drop of Amanda's blood on the bathroom tap. According to the prosecutor, this shows Amanda and Meredith were bleeding at the same time. Strong evidence there was a fight. The principal evidence was mixed blood traces from which were extracted mixed DNA of Amanda and Meredith. The only explanation for that mix is that Amanda was bleeding and touched objects that were covered in Meredith's blood. There's no other explanation. But Amanda's lawyers say this proves nothing. Two young students living together means it's perfectly normal to find mixed blood and DNA in the bathroom. They say it's possible Amanda's DNA isn't from her blood at all, but from her saliva. Sarah Gino is the forensic biologist on Amanda Knox's defense team. In this case, the test was done for blood. But was the test done for saliva? No. So we can't know if inside that mixed trace there was blood because it had been demonstrated or just saliva. Or maybe there was blood from both of them. But what does that mean? Maybe someone had a bloody nose one time, and then at another moment someone cut their finger and put it down, and their blood got mixed. Then there was the kitchen knife found in Raffaele Solecito's flat. This, say the prosecutors, is the murder weapon, which has been cleaned. But they have found DNA of Amanda Knox on the handle, 
and a minuscule amount of Meredith Kircher's DNA on the blade. But the words, too low, are written on the DNA reports for the knife. The test should never have been carried out, say defense. There's not enough reliable DNA. When questioned by journalists, the prosecution stands by its forensic evidence. It is not too little. The genetic profile is low, but it is absolutely reliable. In fact, we were able to get it, which means there is no uncertainty about the attribution of that profile to the victim. More DNA evidence is presented, this time on Meredith's bra clasp. Police say Raffaele Solecito's DNA is on one of the hooks. This is the only evidence placing him in her bedroom. There is no DNA evidence that puts Amanda in the room. David Balding, a DNA statistician at University College London, is recognized as one of the world's leading analysts. In 2012, he is asked by the Italian Forensic Association to study Meredith Kircher's bra clasp and to give an independent view on whether Solecito's DNA is present. His findings are not part of the court case. When you just look at the evidence by eye, you can see very strongly all of Raffaella Solecito's DNA types are there, and that can't be explained by any kind of just environmental contamination. And I calculate how likely is the evidence under the prosecution assertion that, that DNA is there from Raffaella Solecito, and again, how likely it is without him being present, and the, the former is much greater than the latter, so that's when I say that's extremely strong evidence. But forensic experts representing the defense remain adamant that the bra clasp had been contaminated and is unreliable. As far as the bra clasp is concerned, what happened? This bra clasp was collected 46 days after the first crime scene inspection, and a mixture of biological material was found. There was a profile attributable to the victim, which is normal, and other material that was attributable to Raffaele Solecito. There were other traces, but they were not attributed to anyone. But of course, the history of that bra clasp is a bit unusual because it lay in the room for many days uh, without being collected, and so people are worried about the possibility of contamination arising from that. I can't say anything directly because I wasn't there and I don't know the circumstances about the risk of contamination, but what I can say uh, is that Contamination of DNA from passers-by is not an issue. We, I've taken that into account in my... The, the, the chance of it matching Solecito's DNA is extremely unlikely. The defense also uses the crime scene video to question the DNA evidence presented by the prosecution. I have looked at the crime scene. The videos, bloody shoe prints, cleaned up, cleaned up, not saved. A bra strap um, collected weeks and weeks and weeks after the initial collection that now supposedly connects Amanda, Raffaele, and Meredith. But the prosecution keeps producing evidence they say connects Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito to the crime scene. Amanda's footprints, which were revealed by the luminol, show DNA attributed to Meredith which means Amanda was walking in bare feet, covered in blood. They argue this is proof the couple came back during the night to clean up and stage the break-in, leaving blood-stained footprints in the bathroom and corridor. The defense says there is no proof the prints actually were bloodstains. The luminol may have revealed another substance, such as bleach. The prosecution also presents evidence to challenge the couple's story of what they did that night and the next morning. They show Raffaele's cell phone was turned on at 6.02 a.m., despite their claim they slept until 10. Then there was the telephone call to the Carabinieri, when Solecito knew nothing had been stolen and failed to mention the postal police were at the scene. They also question Raffaele Solecito's changing alibi 
and present eyewitnesses who contradict Knox and Solecito's stories. In court, the prosecution accuses Amanda Knox of being the leader of a sexual attack on Meredith. They say this was payback for Meredith's disapproval of Amanda's lifestyle. The erotic game was always part of the case. I think that night, Amanda wanted to make Meredith pay for judging her, which she found offensive. Girl from Seattle that worked three jobs to get to Italy to study abroad, an honor student from Seattle Prep, doesn't overnight, in my experience, turn in to a depraved murderess. Overnight. The court's claims make difficult hearing for the Knox family. Obviously, listening to uh, those types of things were, you know, it's horrible. And, I mean, it was an all-out attack on her character by individuals that have no idea who she truly is as a person. One of the things that we have tried to do this entire time is, is obviously support Amanda uh, by always having somebody over here, somebody to visit her and stuff like that. And... We have to stay strong in order for her to stay strong. June the 12th, 2009. Amanda Knox spends two days on the stand to tell her version of the story. Millions worldwide watch her explanation of why she put the pub owner, Patrick Lumumba, in the frame. They told me that I was trying to protect someone. E mi è stato detto che stavo cercando di proteggere qualcuno. But I wasn't trying to protect anyone. Ma non stavo proteggendo nessuno. And they continued to put so much emphasis. E continuavano a mettere così tanta enfasi. On this message that I had received from Patrick. Su il messaggio che avevo ricevuto da Patrick. And so. E quindi. I almost. Her case is this. She was at Raffaele's house when the murder happened, watching a movie and reading her emails. They stopped watching the film at 9.30. She can't prove it because two of their three computers were damaged when police tried to search the hard drives. Throughout the year-long trial, Meredith's family fly in from London to testify and witness the key hearings. They try to keep the focus on Meredith and their quest for justice. The 3rd of December, 2009, the eve of the verdict. Amanda's family arrives to hear her plea for freedom. She knows that she's innocent and has had nothing to do with this, and we're just uh, very hopeful that uh, the court will see and be able to see that in the evidence that's been presented. Amanda is now almost fluent in Italian. Io non sono calma. Um, in questi giorni io ho scritto su un foglio davanti a me che avevo paura di perdere me stessa. E cioè ho paura... Ho paura di avere una maschera di assassina forzata sulla mia pelle. The 4th of December, 2009. 323 days since the trial started. The verdict is broadcast around the world. Chiara Nox, Amanda, Marie e Sollecito Raffaele, colpevoli dei reati loro ascritti. Guilty of murder. 25 years for Raffaele Sollecito and 26 for Amanda Knox, the extra year for slandering Patrick Lumumba. The Kircher's Italian lawyer is satisfied. Gli alibi the failed alibis, the behaviour of Solecito and Knox's statements, the slander of Patrick Lumumba. These are all elements that, once put together, allow the determination of guilt. 
una dichiarazione di colpevolezza. But Knox's family keeps tight-lipped as they leave the courtroom. Push back. Push back. Chris, Chris, stop. When they return to Seattle, they immediately start preparing her appeal. There's not one piece of physical evidence to link this girl to this crime. They draft legal, forensic and political consultants from the US and Italy to strengthen the defense team. It takes a year to get to the appeal. November the 24th, 2010. By now, Knox and Solecito have been in jail for three years. This time there is a new judge and a new prosecutor, Giancarlo Costaiola. Despite the fact that there had already been a conviction, the deputy judge said at the beginning of the hearing that the only thing that was certain was that a girl was dead. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito's defense teams decide to focus on Rudy Guede. They call prison inmates, convicted criminals, to testify that Guede has confessed to them in prison. June the 27th, 2011. Rudy Guede takes the stand. By now, after an appeal, his sentence has been cut from 30 to 16 years. He denies he made a jailhouse confession and is asked about a letter he has written claiming Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito killed Meredith. The key focus of the appeal is on the DNA. Knox and Kircher's DNA on the knife. Solecito's on the bra clasp. Is it enough to place the defendants at the crime scene or not? The court appoints independent experts Carla Vecchiotti and Stefano Conti from the University of Sapienza, Rome, to review the science. Their report is scathing about prosecution forensic methods. They cite US manuals and standards, highlighting errors made when the evidence was collected. They do find a new trace of DNA on the knife from Solecito's kitchen that hasn't been tested. However, they argue, it's too small to be of use. This report helps the judge focus his decision on whether there is reasonable doubt about the DNA samples. For Meredith's mother and the rest of her family, the hearings are agonizing. Everything that Meredith must have felt that night, everything she went through, the fear and, and the terror and not knowing why. Um, and she didn't deserve that. No one deserves that. October the 3rd, 2011. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito await their fate for the second time. In nome del popolo italiano, la Corte di Assise di Appello di Perugia assolve entrambi gli imputati dai reati loro ascritti ai capi A, B, C e D per non aver commesso il fatto not guilty. There is sufficient doubt for Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito to be released immediately. I'm Deanna Knox.
Knox, Amanda Knox's sister, and I just have a few words on behalf of our family. We're thankful that Amanda's nightmare is over. She suffered for four years for a crime that she did not commit. That Raffaele had nothing to do with the murder of that poor girl, Meredith Kircher, who remains in our hearts. Some in the gathering crowd become increasingly agitated about the verdict. There were people out on the stairs in front of the courthouse, and for a long time they yelled, shame on you. A dark sedan ferries Amanda Knox away to a safe house deep in the Italian countryside for an emotional reunion with relatives after almost four years in jail. While Meredith's family is left stunned and pained by the acquittal. Les has been almost forgotten in all of it. The media photos aren't really of her. Um, there's not a lot about what actually happened in the beginning. Um, so it's very difficult to kind of keep her memory alive in all of this. The media's photos will be of Amanda Knox arriving home at Seattle Airport. I'm, I'm really overwhelmed right now. Um, I was looking down from the airplane and it seemed like everything wasn't real. Um, what's important for me to say is just thank you to everyone who's believed in me, who's defended me, who's supported my family. Um. Amanda finds a home in Seattle's International District and returns to the University of Washington to study creative writing. She starts writing a book about her experience reportedly receiving a $4 million advance, although claims that all of the money goes on legal expenses. Back in Italy, Rudy Guede is still in prison where he has been beaten up by inmates. He has begun studying to build himself a future and will soon be eligible for parole. For a while, this seems like the end of the story. But fate, or the Italian justice system, has another couple of twists in store. Now it's the turn of the prosecution to appeal. And on the 26th of March 2013, Italy's highest court, known as the Court of Cassation, orders a new trial, overturning Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito's acquittals. They say the first appeal did not debate many of the 10,000 pages from the first trial, focusing too much on the DNA evidence. September the 30th, 2013. The second appeal begins. This time, the drama switches to the birthplace of the Renaissance, Florence. Amanda Knox isn't in the courtroom. She refuses to travel from America and defends her decision on television. Only Raffaele Solecito is present in court. He makes a plea to the judge and jury. Io vi chiedo umilmente di poter guardare la realtà di tutto di, di, di tutta questa vicenda e di considerare il grosso sbaglio che è stato fatto. Unlike in the appeals court, this judge orders a police forensics lab in Rome to test the new trace of DNA found on the kitchen knife. It's a minuscule amount from where the blade meets the handle. The new test finds that the DNA matches Amanda Knox. Prosecutors say it further proves her involvement in the murder. But the defense says the most likely explanation is that Amanda used the knife when staying at Raffaele's apartment. The 30th of January, 
2014. Six years and two months after Meredith Kircher's murder, the second appeal of Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito is coming to a close, the judgment watched by the world. Solecito doesn't wait to hear the verdict, speeding off in a taxi. Amanda Knox stays in the United States, plagued by the same fear she shared on television. Shortly after 9.30 p.m. local time, after deliberating for more than 12 hours, the judge and jury enter the hall. In the name of the Italian people, the Court of Assises of Appello di Firenze, in the procedure of penal against Nox Amanda Marie, sollecito Raffaele, ridetermina the penal inflicted on Nox Amanda Marie complessivamente in anni 28 and 26 di reclusione. Conferma nel resto l'impugnata sentenza. This time, an even longer sentence. 28 years and six months for Amanda Knox, 25 years for Raffaele Sollecito. The lawyers give their verdict. This trial has been media-driven. Everything has been amplified. These kids were taken to prison four days after the body was found. They were the first suspects and never lost that image. If it was a media-driven trial, it's not due to the Kirscher family, who have been absolutely silent. So if we're talking about a media circus, we need to look at the behavior of the suspects and their followers. In court, the victim of Amanda Knox's original slander, Patrick Lumumba, is relieved. He's been awarded 40,000 euros compensation. Life has changed a lot, but when you have obtained justice, like this evening, you feel more encouraged to start all over again. Raffaele Solecito has disappeared, but the next day police find him 250 miles away at a hotel near the Austrian border. They confiscate his passport. His lawyers say he wasn't trying to flee the country. He remained free until his final appeal. Anybody losing anyone close to them is hard. Losing somebody so young and the way that we did um, is, is obviously a, a hundred times worse. And then on top of that, to have all the, the, the media attention that has gone on for so long just makes it very, very difficult to cope with. I think we all definitely want some form of closure. I'll even just having it almost at an end of the Italian justice system and knowing that that's the final decision um, and then we can all start to remember just Meredith rather than focusing on who did it or what happened. The day of the final appeal came yet another year later on the 25th of March 2015, seven and a half years from when Meredith was brutally murdered in the hillside cottage in Perugia. Italy's Supreme Court of Cassation was called upon to decide whether or not to uphold the guilty verdict. With no cameras allowed in court, the media camped out on the stairs of the imposing palace of the Supreme Court, interviewing lawyers as they came and went. Amanda Knox's lawyers argued her Florence conviction was a grave judicial error, while Raffaele Solecito's lawyers likened him to Forrest Gump. Those familiar with the story of Forrest Gump know he is an innocent to whom gigantic, crazy things happen. After a day and a half of final arguments, the panel of five judges retired to deliberate. Journalists and legal observers reflected on the possible outcomes. Amanda Knox and her family awaited the decision in Seattle, while Raffaele Solecito went back home to Bari. After 10 hours of deliberation, shortly before 11 p.m., the final verdict was pronounced. The guilty verdict was sensationally overturned. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito were cleared of all charges except for Amanda's slander of Patrick Lumumba. I'm incredibly grateful for what has happened, for the justice I've received. We must no longer suggest any possible involvement of Raffaele Solecito. Enough, enough, enough! Francesco Maresca, the Kircher's lawyer, was stunned as well. 
The final word came with Friday's verdict that declared the innocence of the two accused, although it did refer to the second clause of Article 530, which relates to insufficient evidence. They were acquitted without a retrial, so this is where it ends. That Meredith's memory has touched many over the years has been some solace to her family. We know Meredith is remembered, but as Lau said, it, it's actually almost the, the horrific circumstances that have been forgotten of how she was actually taken from us. Seven and a half years have passed since the death of Meredith Kircher. Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solecito have been found not guilty of her murder, for which Rudy Guede alone is in jail. The very same Court of Cassation ruled he did not act alone. No attempt is being made to find other culprits, leaving many unanswered questions for the Kircher family, who may never know what happened to Meredith that tragic night of the 1st of November 2007.